Hello and welcome guys to the DevSecOps series part two, brought to you by MP Cybersecurity. My name is Marius Poskus. So in the first part, we have covered what is DevSecOps, what are the benefits of Dev DevSecOps, uh, should organiza organizations decide to leverage the framework. We also covered how to create and raise the security bar for organizations. We covered the application review process. We also covered how to build a threat model, uh, what frameworks to use in threat modeling build. We also covered one of the examples of how to do threat modeling. So continuing in the DevSecOps uh, framework build series, we will cover the last few pieces to get a successful DevSecOps program and how should we continue on that path. So today we will cover uh, data classification, um, risk assessment, we will also cover some of the um, bank questionnaires for us to use for developers, uh, how to assess our application builds, and also how we can leverage the tooling in our continuous integration and continuous um, delivery pipelines. So uh, first and foremost, in order for us to assess the risk, we need to be able to classify data that we're going to be collecting in our applications as well as storing or transferring the data. So data classification is one of the key principles that we have to embed that knowledge to our developers. So we will follow the simple classification rule as most organizations can get them more complex or easier, but it's um, we will use four data labels. Uh, so the first label will be public. So Public data is going to be classed as the information that it's available for public use without any restriction and it would not breach any applicable law. So essentially data that can be publicly available. So examples can include things like press releases, promotions, social media content, company details such as, you know, contact details, contact um, address, telephone number. All of this information can be classed as um, public. And then the key point in, in, in the, our um, table will also include what kind of protection uh, our developers should consider in specific data classification. So for public data, uh, as it is publicly available information, it does not require any protection around this type of data. So the data does not need any specific requirements in terms of protection. Now, the next uh, label in data classification will be internal. So information that is communicated within the company with stakeholders, including colleagues, franchisees and third party suppliers and contractors. So that's essentially internal company data that should remain internal. So things like organizational charts, uh, key staff contact details and their key performance indicators, internal memos, uh, high level technical details. So for that information, we will require some uh, protection. So our goal is to maintain least privileged access controls around the data access and also encrypt that data at rest. So these are the minimum requirements and controls required for internal type of data that we classify. Now, if we move into the next two labels, we have a confidential and highly confidential. So now we're moving up the scale where uh, information sensitivity becomes more and more crucial. So confidential data is essentially information that is subject uh, to unauthorized disclosure, distribution, or less could lead to. So essentially it could lead to unwanted breach of publicly identifiable information of an individual's data, which could be in breach of uh, data privacy laws, uh, potentially resulting in fines, um, brand, and uh, and as well as reputational damage. So, loss in confidence between commercial uh, relationships as well, and also day-to-day -day operations being affected. So that's a potential uh, damage that could be uh, caused should the, the, this data become breached. So examples include things like budgets technical specifications, all medical information, bank details, colleagues information, as well as customer or colleague records, including names, email addresses, contact information, date of birth, and etc. 
So for that type of information, we would require a zero trust access model as well as encryption at rest and in transit even within, between the application components. So the key point is here is when we're talking about things like um, Kubernetes or microservices architecture, a key controls here comes into play. Things like those of you who are aware of Kubernetes, we can leverage things like app armor profiles and we can create policies directly in the microservices architecture of where the communication can happen between which containers the communication is allowed and between which ones is not allowed. So essentially creating a, a sort of a zero trust model where should one container become breached, they that, that container can't talk to every single container, especially the ones that has sensitive information. Though That's a key and critical controls to consider when developing your applications and how we can segregate specific data. And then the last but not least is highly confidential data. So essentially, it's an information that is subject to unauthorized disclosure, distribution or loss that could lead to so significant brand and reputational damage, loss in profits and the decrease in value of company share price, as well as loss in confidence from commercial partners, colleagues and stakeholders. So uh, um, examples of highly confidential data include special category data so things like manufacturing and non-patented uh, technology under development or in use that provide a significant technical advantage information relating to mergers acquisitions and disposals unauthorized uh, disclosure of financial information as well as unauthorized disclosure of new technology so again we use similar uh, controls so it's zero trust um, access control, encryption at rest and in transit, even between the application components. So it's again, the same protection models for confidential and highly confidential data. So that's things that we should consider. Now, if we move into risk assessments, it's again, it's, it's, it's part of the model and it's part of that um, creation and shifting into as we discussed in part one is we shifting the target operating model so we essentially embarking and allowing developers more autonomy and more um, power in their decision making but the key goal is we have to build a bi-directional trust between security and developers as well as it in give them the tools and the knowledge so they can make those decisions on, on their own. So they have to know how to classify the data and they also have to know how to measure and quantify the risk uh, through their threat models, through specific applications that they are building. So risk is essentially a, a, an essential part of threat modeling. So as you can see, this is um, on your right, we have a matrix which is five by five. So we can we can essentially cover um the level of impact as well as the likelihood of threat so essentially risk is a combination of likelihood and an impact so for example if we look at uh on the very left we can see is the likelihood so if the likelihood is very low and the impact is very low then resulting risk would be very low but if we go for example the likelihood is very low but the impact is very high then the risk is low and then vice versa, if you go, for example, the high impact uh, and we have very high uh, likelihood, then the risk itself is very high. And also we have to embark the knowledge on there is different types of risk as well that we have to consider. So there is an adversarial risk and there is non-adversarial risk. So adversarial is something like threat actors and, and malicious uh, hackers, cybercrime groups, and things like that, where they they seek to um, create a malicious. They have essentially a malicious intent, whether to gain financial um, reward for their actions or create an impact for organization to create essentially a discredited organization or to create a reputational damage. So. The likelihood, as we just covered, 
there's five stages so essentially whether you name it or you create a numbers one to five it's up to you but the examples are so if it's a very like uh, it's a very low likelihood so the adversarial type of uh, example would be so adversary is highly unlikely to initiate a threat event so that's the very low and then not adversarial um, threat is something like an error or accident or act of nature unlikely to occur or occurs less, less than once a year or occurs less than once every 10 years so that's how we quantify and essentially teach developers to understand what is very low the difference between very low low medium and obviously high and very high so if you're talking about low adversary is unlikely to initiate the threat event so as you can see there is a different wording it's highly unlikely or just unlikely now uh, if we're talking about non-adversarial so there is error accident or act of nature unlikely to occur or occurs less than once a year but more than once every 10 years so as you can see there's a slight difference in in sort of how we measure between low and very low now if we move into moderate so adversary is somewhat likely to initiate threat event and then we if we look at non-adversarial is error accident or act of nature is somewhat likely to occur so it occurs between one to ten times per year so that's how we classify something as being moderate now if we move into high so adversary is highly likely to initiate the threat event so it's highly likely and then if we look into non-adversarial so errors accidents or act of nature there's all um, uh, that is almost highly likely to occur or occurs between 10 to 100 times a year so if we look at something for example like you know how do we classify specific errors or accidents that happen so if accidents happen more than 10 times a year then we classify the likelihood as high it has to be under 100 so when we move into very high so adversarial type of example is so adversary is almost certain to initiate the threat event and then non-adversarial non side is error accident or act of nature is almost certain to occur and occurs more than 100 times per year so something that is more than 100 times a year it's it's classed as very high now if we move to the next slide it's we will discuss the impact so um what would be the impact and how we measure the impact between very low and very high so if we're talking about impact and, and and that's again that's probably will be different for different organization because obviously different organizations will have different um revenues uh, whether it's attributed to a specific revenue or specific uh, brand and reputational damage and every every organization will have different sensitivity to specific impact so it's up to you to when you're building your own framework to determine and get a organizational feedback of what is very low and what is um you know very high but we will just discuss this example that i you know i've used before so the threat event could be expected to have negligible impact to organizational operations so the real world example is system taken offline for a second causing no impact in the overall service outcomes so essentially very low is something that we wouldn't even notice that something happened if it's if it's a blip of a you know second of the uh, second uh, our application being offline for a second just a blip but the whole operation is continuous without impact that's a very low impact now if you move to low so the threat event could be expected to have a limited adverse effect uh, on organizational operations and assets so if we look at business impact so it essentially causes degradation in mission capability to extent and duration that the organization is able to perform its primary function so even though we have a low impact we still can perform our primary functions so results in minor damage to the organizational assets if we're talking about financial impact again it results in minor financial loss if we're talking about human impact it results in minor harm to individuals so potential you know uh, injury that's not significant and then as we took a you know look at real world examples is something like non-critical reporting taken offline causing 
uh, inconvenient. So it does not disrupt our day-to-day -day operations, but can cause inconvenience. That's what we classify as low impact. Now, if we talk about um, moderate, so the threat event could be expected to have a serious adverse effect on the organization. If we think thinking about business impact, so it will cause a significant degradation in mission capability to, uh, to an extent and duration that the organization is still able to deliver primary functions, but with significant reduction. So essentially we can still do our primary functions, but these functions might be reduced or it has a significant impact on, of these, on these functions. Now, significant damage to organizational assets. If we're talking about financial impact, there's a significant financial loss. And then human impact is significant harm to individuals that does not involve loss of life or life-threatening injuries. So th there's a significant injuries, but there is no impact or potential to, you know, threatening life serious injuries. Uh, real world examples will be, you know, past of part of customer identifiable information uh, are discovered. So that's the sort of potential moderate um, impact. Now, if we move into the last two categories, so high impact is something that, you know, the threat event could be expected to have severe or catastrophic adverse effect on the organization. So if we look at business impact, so it's uh, it can cause severe degradation uh, in or loss of mission capability to an extent that business cannot perform one or more primary business functions, essentially. If we're talking about assets, so results in a major damage to organizational assets, uh, results in a major financial loss as well. So, and then if we're talking about human impact, so results in severe or catastrophic harm to individuals involving loss of life or life-threatening injuries. So there's potential life-threatening injuries or even potential loss of life. So if we're talking about real-world examples, so it's something like website or mobile app, goes offline for part of the day so it's a significant part of the day it's not like you know minutes or seconds as we discussed in in previous uh, impact assessments and now the last but not least obviously the very high impact is something that you know the threat could uh, event essentially could be expected to have multiple server um, or catastrophic adverse effects on the organization. So the business impact is essentially organization is no longer able to perform any mission critical tasks. If we're talking about assets, so organization assets are rendered to be unusable. So basically the assets are destroyed. A major financial loss to that organization uh, and, and organization might not even recover. Uh, and then human uh, impact is potential loss of life. And then, so basically the last uh, real world example is website or mobile application. Essentially it's offline and it can't be recovered anymore. So that's the, the highest term of impact. So, so essentially we assess the likelihood, likelihood, you know, multiplied by impact gives us a, a risk scoring and risk rating how we can evaluate the risk. And that's essentially, that's where it goes as you know, as you guys can check back in part one we talked about the security bar and how we you know assess that security bar so essentially when we calculate specific risks from our threat modeling it will be determined when we created our risk bar what is acceptable to move into the next review process or or, in, or even into production so that will be assessed based on those you know calculations based on risk based on likelihood and impact and whether we can move in the process of review, whether we need to refine the threat model, whether we need to schedule a penetration test and so on and so forth. So that's essentially the main characteristics of how we implement that framework. Now into the next part is the very important part. How do we assess the mitigation? So once we've done the threat model, we assess the specific risk and they are potential you know, risks that are exceeding our security bar. So we need to assign potential mitigations. So as you can see, I, I kind of grouped the mitigation from best to worst. So ideally, if we can, as in terms of our mitigations, the best mitigation would be to completely eliminate the threat. It's very rare 
but usually possible by either re-architecting the, the whole architecture or, or adding specific you know mitigations that can eliminate that specific threat it's highly unlikely but sometimes we can do that and we can architect you know completely re-architect the whole application second one not the best but second best uh, essentially mitigation would be to reduce the likelihood of, of the threat event occurring so as we as we discussed in the you know likelihood we can go from very low to very high so how we can inbuilt mitigations that can potentially reduce the likelihood of that event occurring so reduce the amount of times that there is a chance of this event essentially occurring then the third type of mitigation would be to reduce the impact of the threat so again should the threat materialize how we can reduce the potential impact and the fallout of that um, risk occurring that's another way we can uh, treat the mitigations and then the last but not least obviously at a minimum we should always for any specific threats in our uh, development at the minimum we should detect the threat event occurring while using logging auditing alerting and reporting to identify and initiate a response so that's another way where we need to make sure that we always have a logging in place we have auditing in place we have alerting in place so should an unforeseen event happen we have a way to create um, an incident response and respond to specific unwarranted event as quickly as possible so at minimum we always need to have a detection capabilities but ideally we want to either eliminate or reduce the likelihood or an impact of that particular threat of materializing so that's that's a way we take developers on a journey and we always you know it's always two-way street we always you know give them knowledge but also we are there to guide and help and advise on the best uh, mitigations possible so ideally you know to, to to limit the threat as much as possible now we, we we covered in a previous part about um we covered the developer manifesto and essentially what we require and how developers should own their tasks and their and their responsibilities so at the end of the model and and, and sort of documentation that we provide for developers and as part of their training I also like to include things like this it's an infosec bank questions for developers so essentially it's a it's a question bank that while they're going through the design stages and development they can always revert back to to just to create a thought process so you know things like you know i i don't see that often anymore things like you know building an and on court into your solution so should something go wrong we can quickly disable this application the second one is you know our actions your solution takes are transparent visible to customers so whether it's a clear box or glass box or is it an opaque box with lack of transparency because we always want to be as transparent as possible and then secondly you know always have to think you know how are we, how are we storing data especially special categories you know as we discussed com company confidential or highly confidential data you know it's always sparks the thought about have we thought about you know uh, encryption at rest have we thought about encryption in transit so these are just the questions to always to refer to developers while they're developing our applications you know are we ensuring that we're using data only for the reason it was collected and not misappropriating data or misinterpreting its meaning and intent so again that goes into privacy laws and privacy requirements that we only collecting data that we need to collect there is a business purpose for collection of data but we also have a customer consent we also have a privacy notices to the customers of what data we are collecting uh, how are we keeping data up to date uh, so are we making good sound decisions based on the data that we collect that's a very important question as well have we clearly documented all the data we are processing where it's being processed and stored and ensuring its destruction once it's no longer required that's another key point as well we are collecting data for the business purpose when when that data no longer serves a business uh, purpose we have to have a process uh, and a way to destroy that data to make sure that that data is no longer recoverable so with the, whether it's you know 
a paper record data you know how do we shred do we have a specific company that we use the shredding how do we you know delete and purge the data of digital um, storage we also need to make sure are we storing more data than we need for the functionality of our solution so we always have to collect only enough data to make sure that it serves our, our you know application functionality what is our incident response process around the solution or any service accounts what are the triggers and where are the run books so this we always have to have you know they always you always have to think about how do we address should an incident occur you know what are the processes the triggers do we have where are the run books of how we're going to respond to the incidents you know what's the who should we contact who should be involved in the incident so these are the key documentation that um, developers in conjunction with security should create for specific applications so that's you know very important now um, if we move into the second part of the question so again are we performing appropriate input validation against data schemas and data streams coming into the solution to ensure integrity of the data is correct and no tampering upstream could impact our solution so again that's very important you know to think about you know potential secret sql injections uh, attacks that could you know potentially um attack our integrity of the data upstream so you know always have the that back of their minds when they are developing uh, specific solutions you know are we ensuring strict and strong service specific authentication or authorization against the solution its account and its components it's always very important to address that you know do we have complete audit logs for all activities which occur in the environment again very important to have the audit la um, trail uh, for any specific whether it's you know troubleshooting errors or potentially dealing with incidents and you know discovering the impact of specific incidents is data at, encrypted at rest in all locations also is data encrypted in transit in all channels including between components inside the solution so these are the the, the quick thinking questions as i mentioned you know where we discuss data classification there is a data specific requirements to always have data encrypted at rest as well as in transit based on the classification so that's a, just a reminder for developers to always be aware about you know encryption are we ensuring the logs do not contain any sensitive data with no customer data ever logged anywhere including exception scenarios so again you know if we're collecting customer data it has to stay in database it has to it has to be stay it has to stay in approved location we never want to have pii or you know pci type of or hipaa type of data in our logs so we need to make sure that you know there is no that type of data in our logs have we implemented appropriate throttling and rate limiting at all appropriate points within the system to prevent denial of service unintentional uh, downtime due to increased load so again you know how do we limit you know do we have built-in you know num uh, limits on authentication attempts to prevent you know um dictionary and and password guessing attacks have we built-in rate limits to prevent you know denial of service attacks distributed denial of service attacks so you, these these kind of decisions always have to be at the back of your mind when developing an applications. Um, do we have an automated unit and integration test for each mitigation outline in this threat model? So again, when we're building a threat model, we also not only have to build in mitigations and, and limit the risk, but we also have to have unit and integration tests before we push the code in production in the pre-production environments. Do we have a program, pro, pro, programmatic capability to exchange certificates, keys, and credentials in case of compromise and revocation? So should the application become compromised, are we able to programmatically change certificates, keys, or credentials on the fly and limit the potential exposure of, of data? So th this is a very important question again. You know, are we always using allow list approaches as opposed to deny list this is always a key concept that i think sometimes security professionals struggle so it's a, it's a very important thing to empower developers to understand so 
if you think about deny list, it's it's very prog uh, problematic to implement deny list because what we need to do is we need to think of every specific scenario that we want to deny. Whereas on the flip side, on the allow list, we can only whitelist or create an allow list of agreed um, and allowed um essentially services allowed actions that we allow to take and then everything else is blocked by default so it's much easier to create a list of allowed actions than think of all the possibilities of denied actions and create a denial list so allow list implementation is much easier it's probably similar to what we use nowadays in in firewalls where we just essentially create a rules of what is allowed and then everything else is denied and then last but not least is are we handling any payment card industry data, personal identifiable information or GDPR data? So always think about specific requirements in these specific frameworks. So if we're handling any of the data, you need to raise the security bar and include these requirements in your assessments and making sure that we comply with you know, GDPR regulations, the, the privacy laws, the payment card industry requirements, uh, and things like that. And then the last bit, uh, I just wanted to touch, guys, and we can probably expand in a further series about um, how we can put security enhancements in our continuous integration and continuous delivery pipeline. So as you can see the, in the image, there's a, there's a typical flow of how we deploy code in our environments. So we start with the you know, pre-commit, then we have a commit, we have a build stage, we have a test, then deploy, and obviously it then goes into production. So as you can see, there is a number of tools that we can create essentially and automate security in the pipeline to make sure that we limit vulnerabilities and risks before the code goes into the next stage. So most of you guys are you know heard and aware of tools nowadays like SNCC, who allow to you know embed into developers ID environment essentially into their you know code uh, writing environment so essentially they can real time uh, do static uh, application security testing uh, and they can do sort of pre-commit checks the one problem I have with some of these tools as well I think uh, you know it's great to have a, a you know a close feedback loop in that developers ID where they're writing code but the problem is there is no enforcement mechanism for developers to fix potential vulnerabilities in that code. So therefore, we normally would we would have things like web hooks, web, uh, web hooks in our pre-commit pipelines, and essentially, you know, limit. So we can create policies how we limit code before it moves to the next stage. So for example, it says if there is a critical or high vulnerability in the code the code does not pass pre-commit webhook and therefore it's not allowed to move to the next stage so that's the first part when we go into commitment then we have an incremental security application um static security uh, application security testing and then we move into the build pipeline so that's where we actually start uh, getting deeper into the into the testing so we can have another type of uh, static, static application security testing, but that's where we embed tools like SCA. So SCA is software composition analysis. So we're looking at what kind of open source libraries uh, developers are using. Are there potential dependencies in those libraries? Are there potential um, vulnerabilities in those libraries that um, developers might have used from any open source sort of technologies? Then when we go into testing, we again incrementing and then moving away from static application uh, testing so now we're actually testing the code so we are running the code so because when what we did statically we never run the code we just essentially look at the code and and look for potential vulnerabilities in a code now when we move into the test stage we're actually running the code so that that that's where imp we're implementing DAS. so DAS is dynamic application security testing so we're dynamically testing the code while it's being run live and we're looking at potential you know vulnerabilities so it, it, it's similar to you know uh, DAS can be done in a few ways but fast testing is one of them and then we also do um, 
interactive ap application security testing that's a sort of another way of of looking we can also implement tools like because in in the sort of build and test environment we can look at our potential container images and its vulnerabilities also if we using specific builds and we build our infrastructure for infrastructure as a code we can do infrastructure as code scanning and making sure that you know the configuration of our infrastructure is without vulnerabilities without misconfiguration so again we can add specific policies but the goal is to do most of this work automatically and essentially give a feedback loop to developers so you know adding adding these tools and then connecting these tools to create a feedback loop to you know i always say to you know we don't want to develop developers to bring them to our world we go to their world so if developers build their code and manage their code through something like jira so how do we you know create tickets or create vulnerabilities create a list of issues and essentially send automatically tickets to jira for developers who are responsible for their code to fix and then you know then we go to deployment and production and that's where we do things like monitoring you know uh, we do penetration testing we do red teaming to create hypothetical scenarios where something can go wrong you know because the problem is you know we always do deployment or incremental deployment of code but in production the code keeps changing and molding because obviously we're only testing a portion of the code so that's where we do the monitoring we essentially create a red teaming scenarios to actually test our hypotheses to make sure that it aligns to what what the expectation is to making sure that that's the way it should be in production so that's sort of uh, you know the rundown of the Dex devsecops framework guys i hope you you know love the videos please like and subscribe uh, to get alerted when the new videos are up uh, and thank you for your time.